Well, on behalf of the Clean Energy Institute at the University of Washington, I uh, want to welcome everybody to CEI's Lunch and Learn. And before we get started, we would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the ancestral homelands of those who were here before us and those still here. The University of Washington and all of our institutions well, we exist on indigenous land, wherever you are zooming in from today. Here in the UW Seattle area, Native peoples identify as the Duwamish, Suquamish, Snoqualmie, Puyallup, as well as the tribes of the Muckleshoot, Tulalip, other Coast Salish peoples and their descendants. We are grateful to live and work on these lands. This land acknowledgement is one small act in the ongoing process of working to be in good relationship with the land and the people of the land. So we're grateful you have joined us today. And I'm with, um, with that introduction, I'm going to pass it off to Doris Hung, uh, CEI Education and Training Fellow. Hey everyone, I am Doris and I am a graduate student here at CEI at UW. Today we are inviting two of our CEI graduate fellows, John Senker and Jai Lee, to um, tell us a little bit about their research as well as their academic careers. The Clean Energy Institute missions are to accelerate a scalable clean energy future through scientific and technological advances in energy generation, including solar energy and hydropower, energy storage, including battery and fuel cells, as well as um, energy transmission with electric grid. Before we get started on the presentation, I would like to remind all of our audience to submit your questions at slido.com. You can enter the event code CEI underscore LNL um, to enter our Slido page. You can submit your question anytime during the presentation. So now let's welcome our first speaker, John, to talk about some 2D materials research. John. Uh, yeah, thanks, Doris, for the uh, introduction. Yeah, I'm uh, John Sinker, and I'll be talking to you about uh, science in the flat world. Is, uh, yeah, so as a little intro to myself, um, I come from Ohio, which is far away on the other side of the country. And um, but one of the things I really love about Seattle and Washington is the outdoors. I'm very into uh, fishing. I really enjoy interacting with other wildlife like uh, squirrels, uh, cats. We just got a cat, which I am really loving. And uh, I really like other things, kind of more nerdy things like you know, anime and uh, stuff like that. And also another important part is that I'm very interested in science and technology and specifically using optics, the way that we can use light to sort of tell the properties of a material and uh, study sort of the physics that happens there. So I'm a, I'm a physics major uh, and a fourth year graduate student in Shaodong Shu's group. So um, basically the way that my research inter intersects with clean energy is that uh, I study atomically thin materials, which I'll get to in a second. And these materials can potentially enable efficient solar cell operation. In addition to just creating a broad, you know, variety of new technology, such as flexible electronics uh, shown there. Uh, one of my favorites, the space elevator, which people always talk about and just fun to think about. And uh, faster processors that have potentially smaller uh, uh, parts. And so that's sort of the, the, the motivation for this research from a broad level. So uh, when we talk about 2D materials, sort of what are we actually talking about? Well, an interesting way to think about this, um, sorry, can you go to, yeah. So it's actually, you guys all actually already have a familiarity with 2D materials. And one thing that you might not have realized is that if you actually zoom in on your pencil, what you'll find is that when you zoom in enough, there are a bunch of different layers. And if you zoom in even more, you will see just a single atomic layer. And this is the reason why your pencil works so well is that every time that you write with it, you're actually shedding layers. 
And if you were to zoom in close enough on your pencil writing, you'd find a single atomic layer of carbon, which is known as graphene. And that's one of the most common 2D materials that we study. But what do we mean when we talk about 2D? Well, a fun way to think about this is that the height of the space needle uh, relative to the thickness of an index card is the same uh, sort of ratio as that index card thickness to the material that we're talking about, graphene. So it's really, really thin, about a thousand times thinner than your hair. And yet we're still able to see it under the microscope. And uh, yeah, sort of a fun little poll is to think about how strong these uh, materials might be in reference to other things that we consider strong. So by strong, I mean uh, how much it takes to break it. So what would you guys think would be uh, sort of the strongest material uh, that you know, we know of? I think we have a, a poll here. We're going to move forward another 10 seconds okay. until we close the ball. All right. Nope. Okay, well, it's, it's pretty good choices there. Um, yeah, all of them are pretty strong, but it turns out that graphene, you know, by uh by weight is by far the strongest material that we have ever measured and that is uh even though it is actually worth noting that it is just diamond is just another form of carbon but graphene is actually uh the the strongest in terms of the amount of uh strain that it can withstand so how can we use this so basically you Graphene is the thinnest material, and it's also one of the strongest, uh, if not the strongest material that we know of. It has other very uh, unique capabilities, like it conducts heat very well. So just sort of like metal, if you uh, heat it up, it will transport that heat very efficiently. And then there are other unique physics that sort of emerge in the 2D limit. And we can already see that graphene is being used for some applications. For example, in this uh, the back plate for a I think a computer, they're using uh, incorporating graphene to make it stronger uh, while maintaining lightweight and also uh, helping uh, increase the thermal conduction properties to help dissipate the heat in a computer. So this is just, you know, some ways that you can actually already start to use graphene, even though it's so thin and um, relatively new to our study. Another very uh, appealing uh, property of 2D materials is that we can actually uh, pick them up and manipulate them. So here is showing uh, the standard process for transferring a 2D material. And the basic way that it works is you come in with a thing we call a stamp. It's basically just a piece of sticky, like it's just a sticky thing. And then you pick up your 2D material and then you can place it on another one. And this is in the bottom what it actually looks like when we do this in the lab. We basically use a glass slide and we pick up one material and we drop it on top of another one or on top of a substrate, or basically just a, uh, whatever we want to, to deposit on at the end. Um, it's very convenient to manipulate these materials. And this enables us to uh, basically use these 2D materials as Legos. Um, so. Yeah, so basically, uh, this is kind of a fun thing uh, for us, uh, I, you know, even though we're uh, old, we still like to play with uh, toys, I guess. Uh, in, in the lab, we can basically use these 2D materials as Legos, so we can stack two different 2D materials of different types. Um, and one of the very interesting things is that we can actually stack them at an angle. And when you do that, um, it creates a very beautiful result. But just even at the basic level, this gives us a huge amount of flexibility in terms of designing, uh, studying how different materials can interact with each other. So you can study different uh, unique physics in this way, uh, which you can't do using conventional means uh, like crystal growth techniques. So we can create layer by layer our own uh, new crystals, basically. 
And as I said, you can twist them. And when you do that, you see that a new pattern forms. So if you twist two hexagons, it creates this beautiful moray pattern, uh, which is a, a, a hexagon, but with different spacing. And that spacing can be controlled by, tw by the twist angle. And so uh, you can basically create a new material that has an atomic spacing that is, uh, you can just choose whatever you want. It can be as large as you want, as small as you want, just determined by that twist angle. And this is very interesting because what they found is that when you twist graphene, new properties emerge. So for example, if you twist it very accurately to 1.1 degrees, you will see that it becomes a superconductor, even though it's not in the untwisted case. Um, and so you can also study a whole variety of new emergent physics. So this really shows how tunable this platform is for uh, creating new designer materials, basically, that have interesting new properties that might be, you know, relevant for energy, uh, you know, energy, energy purposes. So talk about my research a little bit. What I focus on is uh, basically going off of uh, how strong these materials are. It means that we can strain them a lot. And so strain is basically defined as the change in length divided by the original length. So a way to think about this is basically tug of war. We're basically pulling on both sides of the material and it's changing its length by a little bit. It's getting longer along one direction and shorter along the other direction. And that change in length uh, divided by the original length, say of the rope, is defined as the strain. And uh, the schematic on the right shows basically our experimental setup. We pull on the left and the right, uh, shown by those white arrows. And then our 2D material on top feels a very huge strain, uh, much larger than traditional crystals can withstand, but because it's so thin, it's able to uh, withstand it because there are very few defects. And so uh, this is sort of where my research has been focused. And if we combine these sort of beautiful properties, the ability to form the moray pattern and the ability to strain it, we can potentially see something very interesting. And to illustrate this point, I actually have a uh, video here. So you can start, by twisting your layers and it creates the moray pattern and then you strain one of them and now it creates this very interesting sort of spiral pattern um, that to me looks something like Van Gogh's Starry Night which is uh, also kind of fun it's a little bit of a mixture of art plus science uh, that we can get here and yeah so that, that's what we're I'm working on currently uh, and I guess uh, another Potential question, just to gauge everybody's interest. Uh, what what potential new technology excites you the most that we could potentially make out of these two D materials? I guess if uh, what would you like to see uh, realized out of all these options? We have flexible electronics, efficient clean energy, um, faster computer processors, and a space elevator. We're gonna pause this for a while. Um, if there's like a time lag between our stream and okay. YouTube. Uh, right. Last 10 seconds. Okay. Okay, so it looks like the space elevator did come out on top here in the poll, which I cannot blame you guys, even though it is the Clean Energy Institute, I was also rooting for the space elevator. So, <laughs> okay, so yeah, so a little bit about uh, sort of the career opportunities for um, graduate students and I guess myself, I'm very interested in uh, continuing in academia and hopefully becoming a professor of some sort. Within sort of uh, this path, there is the research professor, which 
does a lot of research, doesn't maybe teach as many classes, but teaches graduate students and, uh, you know, leads a lab. Then there's also the teaching side, which focuses more on teaching um, classes and courses and, um, yeah, getting to know students through in that way. On the other hand, there's also a lot of opportunities in industry. Um, I've had several colleagues who have become like uh, engineers at tech companies. For example, I know someone who went to Facebook, another person went to Intel, uh, a few other companies like that. It's also kind of a fun thing that a lot of physics majors actually end up becoming financial analysts on Wall Street if they really uh, want to make a lot of money. Uh, but and then there's also uh, sort of national labs and also private research. Um, there are research companies that do, you know, private industrial research and also national labs where you have something sort of similar to academia, but a little bit less uh, uh, small, smaller group. And you, yeah, it's just a little bit different. But uh, I'm happy to yeah take any questions about these opportunities or about the the 2D materials. Oh yeah, here are the references for the. Um, all the pictures of anybody, please don't sue us for copyright. And uh, yeah, I think we're ready for uh, Q&A <laughs> if uh, anybody has any questions. Okay, while we're waiting for the audience to submit the questions, I do have a question for John. So um, for what you're currently working on, now as a researcher um, do you find people around you in your lab coming from similar majors in undergraduate you know in college or do they come from more of like a wide variety um, and how do you choose those majors and how do you decide what you want to do with them <laughs> yeah so i would say that our lab has a uh... We have people mostly from like physics, but also material science and chemistry backgrounds as well. So there are people, in fact, in our lab, we have somebody who is a chemistry PhD student. Um, and we also have material science students as well. Uh, but I think a very fun thing about a PhD is the ability to do something that you, you know, didn't even have much experience in beforehand. So I do a lot of sort of optics based uh, experiments, but I had never even like touched a mirror before I joined the lab. So uh, it's a pretty, pretty wide background. As for me, I always um, enjoyed math and uh, physics, but as, as I progressed through uh, college, I sort of realized I like the applied um, side of things a little bit more than the theoretical mathematical side. And so I went to sort of experimental physics uh, but if, I would say if anybody has sort of a curiosity about the world, then this is the sort of the way to go, because we really, um, I think everybody is curious. That's the basic, like, fundamental part is that everybody is curious about, uh, oh, that sounds cool. What happens if we do this, you know, so. Yeah. Um, the next question um, we have is, what is your favorite part of your job? I think my the favorite part of my job is, um, just, I really enjoy working with uh, other people and especially younger students. It's a pretty big lab. So we, uh, yeah, we all have fun together and I really enjoy designing things and um, designing equipment and also taking data. Uh, it's almost like when I wake up and I have a measurement that completed, it's almost like Christmas because it's a little like piece of, like a little present, like a little data. Um, it's kind of hard to describe, but I really enjoy taking data and working with my, with my colleagues. And the last uh, question coming from the audience is how far away is technology like flexible electronics from being mainstream? So that's a really good question. Uh, difficulty with the, with these materials is, uh, making using them in a in a wider sense but something like flexible electronics is actually pretty close they've already been proof of concept uh demonstrations of using these materials uh in flexible electronics so i would say that's much closer than something like the space elevator um as much as it hurts me to say which is very far away but something like flexible electronics is actually relatively close to being able to be used i have seen for example a paper 
that was published where they used uh, graphene to make a biosensor. So basically you can put it this graphene on your finger and it'll be able to sort of sense uh, some of the different you know, biological signals in your body uh, because it's a basically a flexible graphene patch that can act as a sensor, which I thought was really cool. So there are a lot of different proposals sort of like that um, that could be potentially, you know, actually realized maybe within the next 10 to 20 years uh, as we get better at growing these materials and uh, figuring out how to utilize them. Great, thank you so much for answering all of our questions and for your presentation, John. Uh, that is fantastic. Now we are moving on to our second speaker, Jia Yi. And Jia Yi is gonna come to talk about her research on uh, smart grid using um, theoretical approaches. Jia Yi, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Doris. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Jai Li and I'm a second year PhD student from University of Washington in the electrical and computer engineering department. So my research, uh, can you go? <laughs> so yeah, so my research features mostly uh, developing machine learning and game theory methodologies to the control of energy system. And the goal is to yeah, the goal is to promote the operation efficiency of electrical grid, as well as promoting the sustainability, fairness, as well as equity of the energy system and energy market. So yeah, in the last few slides, I'm gonna talk uh, a little about my first, uh, the personal experience. So I finished. Uh, so I finished my high school back to uh, my hometown, China, and I come to the states to do my undergrad at UC Berkeley uh, with a double major in computer science and system engineering. So the reason for me to choose to pursue a, a college experience is because uh, I'm really into the liberal arts education as well as uh, the science problems. So uh, that's why I attended Berkeley to pursue both, study both science and engineering. And alongside, I get to attend all sort of like liberal arts curriculum, such as like uh, uh, literature and also like art science stuff. And um, so the reason for me to choose to pursue a double major in uh, undergrad is because I want to build up my uh, toolkits in computational skills, such as like computer science, mathematics, and statistics. Alongside, I also want to have a system level overview of the problem. Like for example, like transportation system, energy system, like they're all like very large scale system uh, problems to be, to be solved. And the reason for me to pursue a grad school because I was really into the problem I was trying to solve in undergrad and I want to extend that. So that's why I'm here. Next slide, please. So I actually get, uh, get I started to get involved in research uh, back to high school at a local university. I started to work on problem related to ecology. I was growing uh, the cells uh, in the in the lab uh, that is closely related to agriculture. However, uh, the experience taught me that I'm not very good at conducting uh, experiments in the wet lab setting. I, I think I'm uh, more into the computational side of things. So starting from undergrad, I work on uh, F3 uh, research experiences, but they're all like tied to uh, transportation network optimization. As we are all like aware, transportation is a, one of the largest net uh, energy consumer, uh, not just in the US, but also in every part of the world. So that's why like by optimizing the operation of the tra traffic system, we can like uh, reduce gas emissions, reduce congestions. And then this is also very good for uh, clean energy and also like to achieve sustainability. So uh, I think for, for me, my, my personal experience told me that to achieve sustainability action is like everything, but like, how should we take actions? So for next slides, please. So for my, uh, my side, uh, I choose to take action by developing those uh, computational methodologies in order to um, 
uh, improve the operation efficiency. So the first toolkit that I use often is machine learning, which is a system model. So the system model describes the relationship between inputs and outputs. Like for uh, this is a toy example for uh, for um, for reference. So like. For the input, it could be like number of apples, and also we know the cost per apple. We can know the inputs from if you go to the market today. And then, like if we want to know if we will want to buy these apples and we want to know the price of the all those these groceries, we need to compute the price as the number of apples and the cost per, uh, times the cost per apples, which this equation, even though it looks very simple, is called a system model. And in this case, it's no. However, in most the real life scenarios, this system model can get very complicated and unknown. So that's, and instead we usually only have the information on the inputs and output. And we can get this kind of data sets uh, mostly from the internet as well as the, for example, the flexible electronics that you guys are really in, your, in the earlier slides, like we can gather those information from those devices. And however, and our job is to develop the system model uh, to like to, to match between the two. So for instance, like when we see a cat picture, we know it's a cat. Like our brain, they're about like in our brain, actually a lot of things are happening in our neurons and they just automatically tell us it's a cat. But what if we want to teach a machine to identify this is a cat? So we want to know like how this system model work and extract it. So like in the future, when we see a similar picture, we know it's a cat. And we just, when we see a dog, we know it's a not, it's not. But how do we do it? Next slide, please. Uh, so machine learning is a branch of uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah, maybe we can yeah keep going. So like for ML system, uh, so this is this model is usually trained based on the no input and output data. With the input and output, uh, like if we know we have a system data, we can like so for if we when we input the uh, the data set to the ML system, it will predict the output. And by evaluating how uh, how different the prediction is from the given output, we can like we can like use this uh, we can use this loss to like better train our ML al algorithm until like the the difference between the output and the prediction of our uh, current system model to make it better. And in this case, we can use this train system to help with better decision making. Next slide, please. And the other tool uh, kit that I'm really into is game theory. This is actually a more like mathematical tool. So uh, the motivation of using game theory is that, um, so like this is a, and so this is a tool that is a strategic tool to make decisions based on how other people might react to certain scenarios. And like for, uh, and this is actually everywhere in our life. Like for example, we, I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys are very familiar with the game like scissor rock paper. And when, every time we play it, as a player, we are very aware of other players are all trying to make strat uh, develop strategies. Um, that ever and to in order to beat other people like we are aware of other people's strategies and another and another game that i personally really love to play is called monopoly so like this is actually a uh, monopoly example is actually more tied to my research like as a so in in this game setting everyone uh, so the game the market the game is a market and everyone has uh, in the market there are a fixed amount of assets and money cash that we are all trying to win over uh, by playing or uh, by using developing our own strategies uh, depending on the policy in this game next slide please and in energy and 
I actually personally don't realize that until I start working on this research is that energy market and also energy system operation itself is actually a game. As shown in this uh, diagram, like fixed amount of energy is being produced from the generation and the transmission line helps them help distribute the energy uh, to different uh, users. And at, along the way, uh, those like, there are also other energy sources such as solar panel that a lot of other scientists are working on. They're like a lot of, so users take energy from the distribution line. However, these distributed energy resources such as solar panel are inputting energy back to the grid. So there are like certain dynamic going on every, at every second uh, in our society in the electric grid system. And as users, so we are all users of energy system, uh, which means we are all players actually of this electric uh, energy market game, the financial game. So um, we every every user, us, including us, and also buildings and the schools uh, at different levels, we are all like trying to optimize our own utility. We are all trying to, for example, uh, like in right now we are all consuming energy to like hosting this webcast and also we are all like taking energy when we are like uh taking the we are all using the energy when we are like taking the electric vehicles and also like uh doing the commute and like in our lighting system so, however like the amount of energy is very is fixed and there are like a lot of physical constraints that we are trying to satisfy when we are developing the scheme for the like operation of electric system. So the first principle that we always want to follow is to keep the, st uh, the stability of the, uh, to, keep, uh, to maintain the stability of the electric grid system. And we don't, uh, because the uh, common consequence of uh, the failure of that is actually, uh, like for example blackout which which can last like even like weeks for example last year in texas and that is very catastrophic next slide please so in my research uh, i combine game theory and machine learning for electric grid so by treating energy market as a game um, i use machine learning to uh, to uh, make some decisions that we are uh, that are of interest. For example, um, as city planners, we want to decide where we should construct the future charging stations. And in order to do that, we collect data sets on electric vehicles charging behavior, maybe from the past five years, and then like um, and then like we develop a system model that I described earlier to uh, and which will help us to uh, predict uh, the, the future like charging behaviors. And in this case, we can like do some tweaking and we can like change a little uh, and yeah, yeah, and we can like, yeah, in this case, we can learn the system model and then make these kind of decisions. So this is called a real time, a like real time, both actually both real time and long term control and decision making, energy system and energy trading. Yeah, that's all my slides. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jia Yi, and to the audience, our Q&A session is now open um, for any questions you have. Um, a question I have myself is, so uh, it sounds like um, what we're doing with the grid and your research focus is really on how we distribute the energy among a community or some certain space. Um, could you tell us what are some considerations that you would take into account when you are designing those, you know, the distributions of energy <laughs> with the grid? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so I think as I just uh, also like mentioned along the way, so the, there is always, so the first principle that we always want to follow is to uh, keep the physical, uh, we, we respect the physical constraint. Like for example, for transmission line, there are only a certain amount of energy can be transmitted at the same time. Otherwise the, the hardware system will not tolerate it. 
so it will break down. So that's the first principle. And under that, we try to um, we try to respect the using uh, the energy consumption behavior of every user. So like while satisfying each user's uh, need for the energy, uh, we want to achieve some. Uh, we want to uh, like following the like notion of game theory. We want to achieve some like social welfare. Like we want to optimize the societal level uh, benefits like such as like and then like because like and also like in energy system we always like like transfer energy from one area to another to in order to satisfy the need because the energy trend generation is only distribute th those kind of stations are only distributed in certain areas so we always have to do that and how do we do that is a in order to satisfy uh to achieve the social equity is our one of our current problems. Thank you, Jai. That is very interesting and also sounds like a very complicated <laughs> question to deal with. Um, so we have another question coming from the audience. Um, they asked, what do you like most about being a researcher? Um, <laughs> that's a really good question and a very broad question. So for myself, I love the freedom of uh, of like being a researcher, I get to, so as a grad student, basically I get paid to work on what I really like to solve the problems that I really care about. And I know like there are other people who really care about it. And also I get to, and also like I, there are like for each research area, there are like the research communities that people always, always like give feedbacks with for each other's work and then like, yeah, we, you, and you know, so you know, like there are other group of people who care about the things that you are working on. Okay, thank you. And our last question says, do we have to worry about machine learning making bad decisions for us? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. So actually, uh, the like currently, um, so currently uh, our group has been developing like machine learning uh, framework that set, that put a hard constraints on like system stability. So we are like working under the umbrella of a stable, uh, of a stable physical uh, energy network. So while guaranteeing that we are doing the optimization. So yeah, and uh, machine learning, yeah, because like with the data set, data set can be like really biased. And also like maybe the past experience cannot be predicted to the future. So we always have to do like more tuning and there is one branch. Uh, there are actually a lot of branches of machine learning that do different type of things. For example, like you, you develop a system model for one scenario and then you um, add some, uh, you incorporate the characteristics of a new scenario and add it to the system model in certain ways in order to like adapt the system model to different scenario and different, different times. So there are a lot of like current researchers working on that. And yeah, people are trying, it's not perfect. And yeah, uh, yeah there are a lot of people like who are trying to solve this problem. Okay, and that marks the end of our Q&A session, as well as our entire Lunch and Learn event. Well, thank you very much, Jai, for your presentation. And again, um, thank you to all of our presenters and the audience who joined us today. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for hosting and thank you for. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. We will see you next time. This will be a quarterly event um, from CEI. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of your week.